scripture this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But I, brothers, cannot address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in, in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? Good morning. So, as a recap, we've been talking about unity. The first lesson we were talking about was those things that keep us from being united. Second, we talked about being united as in being fully encompassed by God in all his greatness between coming to God as a savior, coming to God as in a teacher, and then coming and being filled with the spirit. Today, we carry the same thought of what do we become? Today, we carry this thought of as God's. We belong to God and we are more than just one thing to God. We are his children. We are his worker. We are his temple. And we are his fool. I don't know how many of you have ever read the Old Testament. How many of you have ever, ever read the Old Testament prophets? I, I got bored. I, I love to read the Old Testament prophets. Did you know there's one where God says, play with toys? I'm not joking. He says, okay, so lay on your side for so many days and set up one of your toys. Okay, set it up, right? And then he says, build a siege work and attack it and tear down it. What? He says, lay on your side for weeks on end and play with toys. Now, this same God who teaches us and says, proclaim my word, then ask the prophet to play with toys in front of everyone. It's almost one of those where you would go, God wouldn't actually tell people to play with toys. I mean, that just doesn't fit. But the fact is that God demands something. He demands that we be willing to be not only his worker, his temple, but he demands that we be willing to be his fool. To be different. In the Bible, we have two terms. We have Christian. We use this term often. When that was given, it was not a good thing. It was one of those, they're one of those Christians. And it was used to insult and attack. And the Romans used it to go, yeah, they're one of those Christians. They're a little weird if you haven't noticed. And then later in the 90s came out this term, Jesus freak. And it was this, they tried to attack us and say, well, you're freaks, you follow God. And we said, yeah, we're Jesus freaks. And we took this, and when God says, you need to be willing to be a fool, he is serious. But let's start with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 5, we're going to talk about being God's worker. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted. Apollos watered. But God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man may lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. 
but he himself will be saved, yet as so as through fire. God doesn't start with this and go, let me tell you, if you choose to be a worker, he says, you're a worker, you're building. It doesn't say, if you had the opportunity to be my worker and start building on a foundation. It begins with, you are building on a foundation. You're starting out on building. And you need to be careful how you're building. Because the second you put on Christ, people start to see work. They start to see the effect. The biggest complaint you'll ever hear about God is, why doesn't he just show up and show himself? And you ask people, why don't you believe in God? Well, I've never seen him. And God said something completely different. The little ones have been talking about this week. The fruit of the Spirit. And they will know us by our fruit. Right? They're talking about the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. The way that Christ has brought us in to God so close that God then gave us his Holy Spirit and that we could then produce fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control in the singular. The one fruit is all those combined. And he doesn't give us this opportunity to think of this and go, well, if I'm working, no, you are working. It may be a work that is going to be destroyed. It's worthless. You are the kind who decides to build this house and you built it out of straw. Three little piggies. Ring a bell. No, that, that's exactly what I get from this. You get these ones building out of stone, ones precious stone, ones silver, ones gold, ones wood, ones hay, ones straw. I got the three little piggies. One builds this house out of straw. And it works for today. But in the judgment day, when that wolf comes bearing down, what happens? The house goes. The other one builds his house out of sticks. It's flat. But there's a wise little piggy. The wise little piggy builds his house out of something strong. And he doesn't have to run away. And he doesn't have to be ashamed of the work that he's done. He doesn't need to come to the end and go... Well, I made it here, but I made it only through fire. I made it only through realizing that what I'd done was really terrible. Think about it. The two, two little pigs had to run away. Their house that they had worked on came to nothing. And that third little piggy, or in this case, the third person, that person who is a wise master builder, the one who built with something stronger. Gold, silver, precious stones. And all that revealed with fire just got stronger. But then God offers us something more than just working for him. He's not like our boss. He is desiring to be our indwelling. He desires to call us his temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. He blesses us by saying this. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. This God who says, I cannot be contained in any structure. I am so great, so mighty, that nothing can contain me. Even the temple was said only to house the glory of God. Not the full Shekinah glory, but a piece of God's glory. The full glory of God could not be contained by anything, but God allowed some of his glory to be placed in his temple between the cherubims. And so that no one would go in, no one would look upon it unless they were perfectly holy, unless they washed themselves, sacrificed, and prepared themselves to be good enough for God not to kill them. Not good enough to receive this blessing, but good enough for God not to just wipe them out. And they were so scared of this that if somebody went in, they would tie a rope to them. Just in case somebody wasn't perfect, there was no way to remove a dead body. So they attached a rope just in case. Because if they did not get it right enough, God was going to kill them. And they had to remove that dead body. 
And whoever went in had no right to be there. So this same God who does that and says, I don't dwell in human buildings, then says, you are his temple. Christ said it this way, and he says it in the future, he says that you will receive as water overflowing. That water would come in and that it would boil over. Where God has received so much that he just doesn't fit. Where we receive God and allow God to change us so much that people see the fruit of the Spirit. That people see that we are the temple and that it is a holy temple to God. God says that if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. God loved his temple that the Israelites built for him because he chose to allow his glory to set there, to rest there. But yet, when he speaks of that temple, it got destroyed. He allowed it to be destroyed over and over and over. After the time of Christ, Christ already says it. He says, not one of these stones is going to be left on another. Today, people go to the Wailing Wall. It is a wall that surrounded the temple. It has nothing to do with the temple. It was like a gate that went around the temple. That was it. And so people go there and they try to get close to this temple. There is not one stone left upon another. Because Christ said, there will not be one stone left upon another. Because they tore down every stone and they trampled it and made roads of it. And they just destroyed it. God didn't destroy it. But yet when it speaks of us being his temple, he says, if anyone destroys it, I will destroy them. It is a blessing that is stronger than every other blessing where we see God's presence dwelling. He says that you matter to him. And he wants you to be his temple. When, when people wanted to worship God in the Old Testament, they would either pray towards the temple or they would go to the temple. It was the only place that it was acceptable to offer God sacrifice. It was the only place that it was acceptable to offer God certain praise. And yet he allows us to be that temple. And the only way that they saw God was at the temple. And today, the only way that people see God, he's invisible, remember? So we got to work with this a little bit. He's a spirit being. We don't see him in the flesh. The only way people will see God is when we live out the fruit. He says that you will know my disciples by their love. You can tell a tree by its fruit. A bad tree does not produce good fruit. A good tree does not produce bad fruit. Christ is telling us that in the Spirit dwelling in us, we can only produce the fruit of the Spirit. We are known by that fruit. And the only way that people will see God is if we choose to let God overflow us. If we choose to be God's temple, that overflows to our surrounding. But he asks us for the hardest one. And it's, it's easy to look at the blessing. It's easy to look at us. He wants to use us. The hardest one is to look at it and go, God, I want to be your fool. I mean, can, you, can you imagine God literally coming to you and saying, for the next weeks, I want you to lay on your side, cook all your food on cow dung, because you don't want to use human dung. That's okay. You can use cow dung. You're going to cook all your food on that cow dung on your side. You're going to prophesy about this city. You're going to build a little fortress. And then you're going to build siege works against it. And then you're going to beat down that fortress. I, I want you to do this so that everyone will see how great I am. And God asks you to be a complete and total fool. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may be become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. 
And again, the Lord knows the reasoning of the wise, that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you, and you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. Too often we're afraid. We are. Too often we're afraid to let this exact thing happen. What would happen, really, if you let God be seen in you? What would people think? Would people be offended? Would some people get angry? Would some people be hurt? Would some people think that you're just plumb crazy? Would some people look at you and wonder why? Yes. The answer is yes. And the way to make this modern is... Did you know that Jesus promised us certain things that were not good? He promised us persecution. But a good way to not be persecuted is to shut your mouth. Shut it. Seal it. Zip it. Don't overflow with the Spirit. Because if you do, He guarantees persecution. A guarantee from Christ. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And the answer is, you will look a fool. Because in, in modern day, you will always hear that there is this wisdom of man that is going to outsmart God. One of these days, we're going to figure out how to make a man, and we'll be better than God, and we can replace him. And Nietzsche said, God is dead. Man is God. We, he is no longer needed. And that is what you will get in the world. And they all wanted something that made perfect sense to them. And they wanted this exact knowledge. And he said, no. You want the wisdom of God, you better get rid of the wisdom of man. You better quit thinking how great man is and realize how sinful and wick, wicked and sorrowful we should be. And realize that being a fool is better than being wise. It is better to be a doorman in the house of God than a king anywhere else. It is better to be a fool for God than the wisest man ever. And he tells us that all things belong to us. He says that he has given us everything. And it goes back to this, God, if he is lived out, if he is practiced in everyday life, we're going to look weird. Paul describes us as aliens. He goes, we look like foreigners. Everybody else looks similar and we just look really weird to them. And God's word needs to come across as something greater. And we need to come across so that people don't go, I've never seen God, but they go, I've seen God in. I, I want somebody to come to the end of their life and they say, I, I saw God through Matt. I don't want to come, somebody to come to their end of life and they say, I saw how wicked the world was through Matt. I saw how hypocritical the church was through Matt. I heard the hate. I heard the violence. I heard the impatience, the unloving, unkind, ungentle, unfaithfulness. Because with these others, unless we are allowing ourselves to go to the full extent, we can't do either of these completely. We can't be God's worker completely when we're afraid of looking dumb. 
We can't be God's temple as it is tended to be to stand on a hill and let the light shine before men so that they may glorify our Father in heaven when we're afraid of looking dumb. The only time you, you really know you're going to look dumb is get in front of a ton of people and stand on the middle of a hill. You'll say something wrong. The way to look smart is to go hide in a cave. But God calls us to be light, to be salt, to be his temple, and to be his fool. And to be so glad that he wants us to be his fool. That we're not afraid to live out for him because if we look foolish or dumb or they insult us or whatever they throw at us, we just don't care. Because I would rather be his fool than be respected by all men. Christ said it. What if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? That's a waste. And too often we want what the man can offer us. But not what God can offer us. Galatians 3, 27 and 28. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. I've given you cards today, and I want you to be honest, and I want you to think about this. And this requires a tiny step in a giant step. I want you to either write it down or don't. You don't have to. I am a fool. Because at the point you're willing to be a fool, this is completely possible. When you are willing to take God and say, your foolishness is better than our wisdom. Then, then you are ready to use these words, Jesus is Lord, to the full extent. Because if, if God calls you in, him as king, and he says, I want a new jester, I'm like, hey, sign me up. I don't care. You're going to let me be in your court as your jest? Okay, excellent. But if I come in there and I say, no, if I'm not a first rank general, then I really don't want to serve you then you miss the point of Jesus as Lord. And if you're not willing to say, I am willing, I am a fool, then you are not ready to use the words, Jesus is Lord. And once you are ready for that, you can then see this, where everything disappears. Your ethnicity, gone. Your status in society, gone. I don't even care if you're a slave. It doesn't matter anymore. Male or female, gone. It doesn't even matter. And we become one in Christ, clothed in Christ. This invitation has three parts as opposed to normal. One, I want you to write down if you're willing to be God's fool. And, don't, and write it down and keep it so you can be reminded, I'm willing to be his fool. That means no matter what comes your way, you're ready for that because you'd rather be that jester than be on the wrong army as a general or a king. But today we offer an invitation in which you can be clothed in Christ, one with him, saved, becoming God's temple, and receive all those blessings we've talked about. If there's anybody who, having heard the words of Christ, believe Jesus as Lord, confessing him as Lord before men, not being ashamed of him, repenting of our sins, understanding we are wicked and he can cleanse us, being buried with him in baptism so that we can then live for him, so that one day we can be with him. Or if there's anybody who needs prayers, or wishes to be added to this congregation here. We ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing.